Today we're going to talk about um, some of the, the processes that are related to um, the laws and regulations. We've talked some about the different laws and we're going to do a quick synopsis of each one so that we can put them into context because um, I think until um, you actually experience or deal with um, these in context, it's, it's really kind of difficult and confusing to see how it all plays out. So, um, if you recall, we talked about um, several different um, <coughs> considerations. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about are just special services in general. There are some terms that you need to keep clear in your mind. Um, we, you will hear or see the acronym FAPE. FAPE is a free, appropriate uh, public education. That was one of the things that was specified as being required by um, the legislation. So it says that um, when it comes to serving children with special needs, um, including children with hearing impairment, that they are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. And that's specified um, in IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was most recently revised um, for this year in uh, 2004, but it also was revised again at the end of 2012. So, so <coughs> slide. there were very minor wording changes. So the law itself is intact. Then we have um, the Rehab Services Act of 1973, uh, particularly Section 504 is what we're concerned about. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act from 1980. When it comes to the school setting, there are 13 conditions that are officially recognized as qualifying conditions under ID. If a child does not have one of these 13 qualifying conditions, they will not, I'll say that again, they will not be eligible for an IDP. So if they don't have one of these 13 qualifying <coughs> conditions, 
they will not be eligible for an IEP. Okay? And those 13 qualifying conditions are listed there. The ones uh, most relevant to this class being hearing impairment, uh, deafness, and other health impaired, uh, because they may have um, multiple medical conditions going on of which hearing loss is a part of it, and so they would be identified as other health um, In addition, <coughs> um, speech and language impairment is also a qualifying condition. Yes? Um, what do they have to, like, what do you mean, how do you get qualified for other health impairment? Like, what is that? That would be where you have multiple medical conditions going on at once, so that okay. they would be likely to interfere with your education. So say you're a kid with cerebral palsy, and so you have mobility issues, you have um, speech and language issues, you may have swallowing impairment, you may have multiple things going on at once. So that's, um, but the unfortunate thing is they don't specifically define a lot of these terms. Yes? Uh, we're in the schools right now, and a lot of kids that are other health impaired have babies. That's like, that's yeah. kind of a catch-all for them. Because ADHD is not technically a specific learning disability, like dyslexia or dysgraphia or dyscalculia. So, um, and that's, it's good that that exists and that they're allowing that um, category to include ADHD because obviously kids with attention deficit problems are going to be more likely to encounter problems. And until they actually, and it's relatively new that they've allowed ADHD to be included there, um, these kids often didn't qualify for an IEP. They had to <coughs> by the court. I would suggest that later on when you see some of the definitions that we're going to talk about that auditory processing disorder should either qualify under other health impairment or I think more specifically under a specific living disability. Because when you read what their definition of learning disability is, and you compare that to what we know our definition of auditory processing disorder is, you're probably going to be scratching your head like I do that, okay, then this doesn't qualify how. Anyway, so know that regardless of what they have going on, if they don't have a condition that is um, going to fall into one of these 13 categories, they're not going to be eligible for an IEP. Flip side is, just because they have one of these qualified conditions doesn't mean that they are guaranteed an IEP. It just says that if they don't have these, don't even bother because you're not going to get it. Another term that we hear thrown around is the LRV, the least restrictive environment, and then obviously the IEP, the individualized education. Okay? I am not going to ask you on an exam what are the 13 qualifying conditions. I might ask you to explain which ones are and why is far you know, as far as relevant to us and the ones that you know, are most relevant are going to be deafness, hearing impairment, other health impaired, and speech and language. Um, when we look at the utilization of special services in the U.S. public school system, <coughs> information from the Department of Education um, in 2007 Children who were um, receiving special services, nearly half of them, over 40%, had some sort of a specific learning disability. Okay? The second most was 19% who had speech and language deficits. Okay? Hearing impaired was all the way down to only 
1.2% and deaf were less than one half of 1%. So children who are deaf make up a very small percentage of the children getting special services. Hearing impaired children are very small. The biggest um, proportion of kids that we might deal with are going to be your speech and language. And there's a possibility, although they don't count them, you can have a kid who actually falls into one of these categories. So what they typically do is look at what's the primary um, condition that is impacting their educational experience, and they go by that. Okay. So IDEA, again, was originally passed in 1975 as PL 94-142. And then it was amended um, and made permanent in 97, and it's been subsequently revisited in 2004, and again last year. And the goal was to ensure FAPE, regardless of disability, in the least restrictive environment. So free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment without regard to their disability. Okay? It says that kids 3 to 21 are going to qualify. <coughs> and it um, says that the state is required to identify, <coughs> locate, and evaluate all children with disabilities within their district and to develop an IEP for the children who eligible and review it at least once a year and that's one of the critical pieces as I'm sure you folks in the schools right now are probably having um, the clinicians that you're working with kind of tearing their hair out because a lot of those annuals are due for review um, so again has to be re revisited every year to make sure that it's staying open. Um, they also are responsible, the schools are responsible for transitioning children from early intervention programs like First Steps and Help Me Grow into the schools. So it's their responsibility to help those families and, and integrate those children um, as students. They also are required, IDEA requires, that the local public schools provide special services to children in private schools within the, um, the boundaries of the district where they reside. So, if I had, if I had my son attending a, a private school as opposed to a public school, Sunnyside Public Schools would still be responsible for providing any special services. Now, I would be responsible for potentially getting him there, you know, transporting him <coughs> there later on. And they don't have to go to the appropriate school board or to the private school, but they would be required to provide the services if it was being appropriate. Um, another thing specify by law is that folks providing special services are actually appropriately trained and qualified and credentialed. Back in the day, um, before IDEA, before PL 94142, um, a lot of times schools did everything that they could to present obstacles so that families would be less likely to try and secure services for their kids, especially, and even if they did navigate through all those obstacles, they frequently didn't um, have someone who's necessarily qualified to provide it. It might be a parent volunteer, um, someone who's not necessarily trained. So. We actually had to put that into law. Um, which is scary. I mean, we don't allow 
you know, someone who called themselves a physician or a dentist or, you know, whatever, a nurse, without having proper credentials and training, and yet we were willing and able for a long time to allow untrained professionals, non-professionals, to provide services to our kids. That we pay professional athletes and entertainers gazillions of dollars, and yet we complain when our teachers are making $60,000 a year, and that's coming out of our tax money. How much is your kid worth? I know how much mine is worth. I know how much you know it costed. You, know, you have insurance. You know, people have babies all the time, and they pay their you know, their out of pocket you know, fifteen hundred dollars or whatever it was. And you had to pay for everything that was involved out of your pocket. It would be a lot more than that. So I know because we did. So we had a hand up. Um, I was just going to say that concern for people being appropriately trained. We also have a lot of problems with like the educational aides doing too much for the kids with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of because who's the educational aide? It's usually a mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do moms like to do? Take Bottle. care of kids. Yeah. yeah. So their their intentions are usually now there are some. Right. That yeah. Like. But um, but for the most part, but you're absolutely right. So what can often happen is if you have a kid that has multiple problems or is significantly impaired, they will have often um, a dedicated aide who's with them the entire day. They call them Velcro aides because they're kind of attached to them constantly. And there are some that are awesome. They are extremely uh, good at what they do. And there are others who either are very disinterested and not in teaching or you can also have some that are at the other extreme where they basically do everything for the child, and that's not good. <coughs> and unfortunately, there are not, in most places, very strong, um, clear-cut credentialing requirements for someone to be, they call them an instructional assistant, an IA. So, if you have a good one where you're working, Recognize them all the time with little goodies, little perks, praises, because they're the ones who are really going to make a, a break the situation. So, anyway, we actually had to specify that, by the way, if you're going to work with kids with special needs, you need to be qualified to do that. Um, the other thing is that um, <coughs> a lot of times before IDEA, the predecessor, um, not only did schools try and throw roadblocks in front of parents to kind of discourage them from enrolling their kids, once they got there, these kids tended to be singled out as disciplinary problems, behavioral problems, at a significantly higher rate than the general school population. And so they were getting expelled or suspended. And and that trend was noticed. I think it's a good to catch on to that. Um, anyway, they did finally um, include that in the legislation that they, they have to make sure that there are procedures in place to assure that these kids don't get beaten at a higher level. So, the rules say that the kid has to have a qualifying condition, so one of those 13 conditions, and they have to meet eligibility requirements. It's not one or the other, they have to be both. So just because they have a qualifying condition doesn't mean that they're going to be eligible. And unfortunately, IDEA is nothing if not big. Um, and that is that it doesn't give specific criteria 
for determining eligibility. That is usually left up to the local districts, sometimes even at the school level, um, the highest up it's going to go are some state regulations. So typically the State Department of Education will lay out some general guidelines and then it's left up to the local districts and sometimes even the individual schools to interpret those. And so you may have a kid who was in Cincinnati Public Schools and had a qualifying condition and was deemed eligible and was getting certain types of services in a certain frequency and duration, and the family moves, and they're in another district nearby, and the kid's IEP may be totally revised, and they may, you know, that their um, eligibility may be redetermined, and I've actually seen it where the kids were deemed ineligible when they moved. So, um, there's a lot of interpretation and subjectivity. So in addition to having that qualified condition, we have to show that that condition has an adverse effect, and that's or an adverse impact, that's their words, on the child's educational experience and that that creates the need. And the main thing that they're looking for is one of four problems. The condition has to result in there being a discrepancy between their performance and their ability. So there has to be an achievement gap. They're not doing as well as they are potentially able. So a performance achievement gap. They have to demonstrate limited progress or a deficiency in one or more cognitive areas. So what are cognitive areas that we might be looking at? Problem solving. Problem solving, calculation, um, reading comprehension, language, speech. Any task that would qualify as an executive function, basically anything that speech pathologists would work with, is certainly going to qualify. Um, therefore, there has to be evidence of emotional or behavioral um, disturbance, or they have to have documented gross and fine motor skills uh, issues. So, OT and PT would probably be working with those kids. Um, psychology and behavioral interventionists would be working with the kids with the emotional and behavioral issues. Um, Special ed teachers and speech pathologists would be working with um, the kids with the cognitive um, issues and or with the discrepancy in their in that achievement and performance. Okay. So, 13 qualifying conditions and then there are four specific eligibility requirements. Qualifying conditions and eligibility requirements. Those are important concepts. I've talked about them several times. I've pulled them out separately and reiterated them. That's something that you need to know. Okay? They have to have this qualifying condition and its educational implications documented by a professional within that area too, so whose scope of practice it's within. Um, the parent can, I don't typically tell them this, the parent can request an assessment from a non-district provider. Did you know that? So let's say the school evaluates the kid and they say, well, yeah, he has the qualified condition, but he doesn't meet the eligibility requirements. Or no, he doesn't even have the qualified condition. You as a parent have a right to say, you know what, I'd like a second opinion. So um, on your dime, 
I want this child seen someplace else. And the district does have to pay for that. They cannot limit them to only their own providers. Why is that? Unfortunately, most districts don't publicize to the parents that, oh, by the way, if you don't agree with us, or even if you do, um, you can request uh, that someone else provide the assessment. So, anyway, something to consider. So, if the kid is able to navigate through, so if they have the qualifying condition, they've had the assessment, <coughs> and they are deemed eligible for services, then um, they're going to qualify for an IEP. And that IEP has several things that must be present. First of all, it has to have um, what their current capabilities are. What's their current educational um, performance like? It has to have an annual set up annual long-term goals. So they set a goal for what's going to happen for this next year. As well as the short-term goals, the short-term objectives for getting there. When you are working as a professional, depending on what setting you're in, who's paying for your services, um, your long-term and short-term goals may have different time frames attached to them. For example, if you are in acute care, your long-term goal is probably three to five days out. So that means your short-term goal is probably the same. The long-term and short-term goals are often the same. If you're in um, a rehab setting, typically the maximum that you can hope for is 90 days. So your long-term goal would be really for 90 days. And then your short-term goals, you'd probably write for one, two, and then three months out. In this setting, your long-term goal is where you think you're going to be one year out. And it's not necessarily based on the academic year because a lot of times kids may get picked up or qualified during the summer. And so um, they try and run it as close as they can to the academic year, but that doesn't always happen. So it is a full year. And they have to identify short-term goals. Um, I don't know how every district does it. I know that when I was doing some consulting work in Boone County in Northern Kentucky, uh, our short-term goals were what we estimated we were going to achieve um, each quarter. So each grade But some of them, you know, they may have different criteria. So we have their present performance level, their long and short-term goals. We have to spell out exactly which services are going to be provided and how we're going to accomplish that. Is it going to be done with pull-out services? Is it going to be done with consultative services? Is it going to be done with collaborative services? So to what extent is the child going to be removed from that mainstream or that typical classroom environment? 
we have to stipulate what, if any, requirements of um, the state uh, educational objectives are going to be modified or changed. Give me an example of something. We have a kid who um, is hearing impaired. What is something that we might have to modify for him or her in terms of state requirements? Yeah, a lot of it's related to testing, testing environment. Um, sometimes it's um, if materials like for example should be not be able to hear. So like in my son's school officers have to answer if they can't accept the third grade because they claim the recorder <laughs> in the fourth grade. My ears will never recover from <laughs> They might have to modify that requirement. Maybe the kid would have to show some mastery of a percussion instrument because there's vibro tactile input, for example. So, but they, they, you have to show and clearly spell out if any of the statewide requirements are going to be modified. And they may not be. You know, the, the notation there may be NA, but if there are, you have to list when services are going to start how often they're going to be provided, for what duration of time, how many minutes, usually, they have minutes, um, and where. <coughs> so you, guys, you guys have to track your minutes, right? Religiously. <coughs> um, because that's how, that's one of the measures. They have to document and then demonstrate they met those objectives. And then finally, they have to say how they're going to monitor progress and how the parents are going to be notified. So there's a lot that needs to go into that IEP. It's not something that you could just quickly, oh, okay, here's my test results, this is what we're going to do. Thank goodness in most districts they have computer software, it's electronic medical records basically, that has drop down boxes and then based on results that we can, it will help you decide that. Um, but there are a lot of districts that just can't afford that stuff, and so people are still you know, doing it more or less back then. So make sure that you know what the expectations for you. Okay, so. There are also specifications as to who sits on this IEP team. Who makes it up? The parents must be included. We have a friend whose daughter is 13. She has Down syndrome. So she has some cognitive issues. Um, her social skills are fantastic. Her pragmatics are really good. But she did have some language issues. She had more problems cognitively than she did communication-wise. Um, she did pretty well. Well, mom and dad recently got divorced. Mm -hmm. And that kind of put her into a huge tailspin, which you can imagine. Her potential and suddenly telling mom moved. So, you know, her world as she's known it her entire life was totally disrupted. And um, they were, mom was wanting to join custody. So now we were going to have a child who was going to be spending some weeks in Indiana public school and some weeks in Ohio public school. And mom and dad, it was not a Mom and dad was very contentious. It got to the point where they actually had to appoint, they had to 
hold the IEP meetings for the Indiana District at the local police station in an interrogation room because things had gotten so contentious and so they had to have an officer present in the room with all these other people that were talking about. So things can change depending on the circumstances. But absolutely the parents have to be there. You have to have one of the child's regular teachers. You have to have at least one of their special ed teachers. Um, that could be a speech pathologist or audiologist. They, because they are providing special services, they do qualify there. You have to have someone who is a supervisor of special services there. Of bureaucrats. So they're going to approve those minutes and all that other stuff. You have to have someone there who can interpret the evaluation. So that's why a lot of times speech pathologists may actually be serving the rules. If they're providing collaborative services, they count as special ed, and they're there to interpret the results as well. Um, any other person who has knowledge or expertise regarding the child um, can be invited by the parents. So um, we have friends that, two of my friends that have a child with Down syndrome, and they have been having some issues with the type of quality of services that their daughter was getting um, when she was in elementary school versus now that she's in junior high school. And because of my expertise in general, my familiarity with the child, because I see her on a regular basis as friends, but I also was her Sunday school teacher, so I also saw her every week in that context, um, they actually asked me to come to the IEP meeting to talk about some of the regression that I saw tied to when her services were dramatically because this is a kid who went from being in um, mainstream classroom for all of her specials, art, music, phys ed, things like that, um, was in a um, special ed classroom for math, but was in a regular classroom for most of her other classwork <coughs> when they she got into junior high, they completely mainstreamed her, and <coughs> she got, um, I think she was going from a total of like six hours a week of special services between her club and, um, and everything to down to 35 minutes a week. Um, and she was regressing, and it was really obvious. And so parents asked me to they could ask an educational advocate <coughs> to come, they could ask grandparents, they could, you know, anyone, a babysitter, anyone that could provide uh, expertise about this child can come, but they have to be there at the invitation of the parents. Okay? And if it's appropriate, we certainly want the kid to be there. So a lot of kids that have the other health other medical um, conditions like kids who have ADD or ADHD, particularly as they get older, it's very important to include them, children with hearing impairment, it's important to include them in the IEP process so that they can have an active role. They're going to they have ownership and input, they're going to be much more likely to pretty comply. Um, with learning disabilities, um, I throw this in as part of my frustration <coughs> process. Um, learning disabilities fall into four categories. We have input, integration, storage or memory, and output types of, um, they sometimes will call these um, output or organization. Um, but those are the four main categories. Well, an input learning disability is defined as a problem with information perceived through the senses such as visual and auditory perception. And they define an auditory perception problem as 
having difficulty screaming out competing sounds in order to focus on one of them like a teacher's voice. Does it not sound like auditory processing disorder? So I personally feel like under their definition and our understanding of APD, it should qualify as an input specific learning disability. They say no. Now some states have gone ahead and included it, even though idea is a federal rule. Um, some states have gone ahead and they've included APD under this category or even under the hearing impaired category. But I get really frustrated. So for hearing loss as a qualifying condition um, it can be permanent or it can be fluctuating. Why is that important? Yeah, if you've got a kid who's got chronic recurrent ear infections, um, <coughs> on any given day, they may or may not need um, accommodations in the classroom. And we're not going to be providing assessment every single day to figure that out. So uh, if we know that they have the history of the document that is there, they're going to qualify for the services. Um, it's also hard to gauge how much information they're actually missing on each occasion that they're having. Yeah, on any, yeah, yeah, on any given. Yeah, because maybe one time it's both ears are affected. Another time it's only one ear that's affected. Um, maybe one time you know, they're virtually, you know, they have virtually blue ears, so there's almost nothing going through. Other times they might just have a little bit of negative pressure. And so things, you know, it's like when your ears pop when you're flying in an airplane and suddenly you're like, oh, I didn't realize I wasn't hearing and that won't be blasted out. Um, so it can be permanent or fluctuating. The loss can be unilateral or bilateral. That ticked off a lot of the state departments of education. Because they basically were saying, unless it was permanent and it was in both ears, we ain't messing with it. But it's the federal law. Federal law always supersedes state law if the federal law is more constricted. Um, so, unilateral or bilateral. Typically, um, the loss has to exceed 26 dB in the better ear in order to be considered. Many states do not include a specific um, threshold measurement when they're <coughs> their loss. But federal law says if it exceeds 26, they absolutely qualify. But some states don't specify so that even, because technically the pediatric hearing loss begins when their threshold exceeds what? 15 years. So if they have 16 years or higher. Um, and so if the law doesn't specify something then um, the federal guidelines um, because auditory processing is not considered a hearing loss, and in many states it's not considered a specific learning disability, it frequently does not qualify as a qualifying condition. It is not considered an auditory perceptual deficit by the U.S. Department of Education. That's where the problem is. So know that unless they have an actual threshold loss, fluctuating or permanent, unilateral or bilateral, they're not going to qualify for hearing impaired services. <coughs> so, another consideration before, even though we may have a child with a qualifying condition 
and approved eligibility, there's an intermediate step that they will go through before they will actually implement the special services. They will go through a period called RTI, which is response to intervention. Are you guys dealing with RTI? Can you give us an example um, of a situation? Some, a lot of my kids in RTI maybe have articulation disorders, but we don't want to put them on an IP because we think if you give them an intervention, they can get better before, or you have to fill out all the paperwork and put them on put them on an IP. Like a lot of kindergartners and first graders are in RTI, they don't necessarily you know, want them to be on an IP because they might not need to be there in a year, so we just do an intervention with them. Okay, and what kinds of things would, would be included in that RTI process? Um, we do like a screening to see if they were right. qualified at all. Um, and then like some more informal evaluations, not necessarily a formal evaluation, maybe just like having some talk to us if it's an articulation and see how their speech sounds, talk to their teacher, see how they're doing in the classroom, if they're concerned, maybe send a note home with their parents, and then just start therapy with them and see if they get better. And like a lot of times, kindergartners and first graders will get a lot better, and then we want right, to put them on it. You might just demonstrate a few little tricks to them, and so it allows for a very condensed version. Sometimes it's not even meeting with the, the professional. It might be that you as the professional provide some little hints and tricks and suggestions to the classroom teacher or that instructional assistant, and they will try some things. And if the child responds to the intervention, um, then they will not go through the formal IEP process. Um, so it's a, it's a way of looking to try and prevent the need for full-blown special services. Um, if the child doesn't respond to these more generic, general, less invasive, for lack of a better word, um, interventions, then they will go through the full IEP process. Okay? All right. So, under IDEA, the way the process is going to work is the child is identified by way of a screening or a referral. Someone says, Ooh, I think there's a potential issue with this kid. They're going to try some uh, classroom-based response to intervention. They might get some resource assistance. They might get a referral to the speech pathologist to see what's going to happen. Then, based on how they respond, so if they don't respond as well as we would hope, they actually are formally referred to the specialist, could be the SLP, audiologist, psychologist, reading specialist, whatever, whomever. And they are then evaluated. If at the time of evaluation, the child is deemed to have normal skills, process and if there is a deficit, then we're going to continue on to the IEP process, <coughs> and that's where the team is then going to review all of the information. They're going to look at what happened because they have to document the RTI. They're going to look at the screening. They're going to look at the assessment, and they're then going to determine whether or not the kid is eligible. So that eligibility determination doesn't come to one of the very last steps. Then, they're going to either implement services or they're going to deny services. And if they're implemented, then the team and the parents need to set the IEP. Typically, the parents are notified and involved from the very beginning. And this is where a lot of problems happen. If it has a qualifying condition, they have an assessment, and as a result of this eligibility determination, the IEP team decides to deny the request for services. And for some parents, they're cool. That means there's nothing wrong with their child. They're not being as good. For other parents, you know, who recognize that sometimes kids do need some special services and that there should be no shame in that, 
um, then they, they can get a little ticked off and things can get a little fancy. And then you typically go through a process of, of mediation. Um, sometimes that even begins to include lawyers. Um, where then there's negotiations as to do we continue with the, the no-go decision or do we modify that and provide some of the services. So there's a lot of um, give and take a lot of negotiation. <coughs> The parents can say one way or another that, like, if their child doesn't have to be qualified for an idea, they love it, they like, no, we don't want their child to have to They can say that. Um, typically, then, that's an open for allegations of neglect and abuse. <laughs> um, because you have, obviously, ample documents stating that if it needs these services. So a lot of times what will happen is um, the parents will take a kid from the district and the kid from the school. Um, the short answer is yes, parents can do that. How often does it happen? Very rare. They'll usually do some other alternate. They'll either pull them out and put them in a parochial school or a private school not tell them. Um, so then there's an issue for the pool now. So parents can always say it's not always in So does that kind of make sense? The step by step of what happens? Are you sure? I'm giving you a very yeah. thumbnail sketch. You guys would agree. Well, let me ask you, because you are living this. This is your world this semester. What would you add? What pearls of wisdom or advice um, might you add to what I've talked about? Some people don't always follow the process that needs to occur. As in, some people as in... Um, are you talking parents, professionals? Likely, likely gen ed teachers more than others. Okay. Um, so you have a kid who has an IEP and some, well, thing, and some things supposed to, or maybe they're an RTI, and something's yeah. supposed to be happening in their classroom mm -hmm. because they don't have an IEP yet, so it's up to the general ed teacher. Yeah, it's and more so like it. they'll skip directly to an evaluation when we've never even heard this child's name or had any concerns from the, the teacher. About so rather than saying, hey, I'm concerned about this kid, can you yeah. give me some things to try, yeah. um, they'll just go ahead and refer. Yeah, because when we have 80 kids in therapy already, and then referrals for evaluations, like it needs to go through the appropriate process before we decide, yeah, let's do a full-blown evaluation. Like we can refer for a screening. It's just a lot to, a lot of people to deal with. Like it's good having this great team of professionals to help this child, but it's also a lot of people to keep on the same page. Yes. A lot of different hands. Yeah. In the go. Okay. Yeah, and, and that I can recall being a real frustration. The other thing is sometimes we do have this, you know, we can even go all the way through, we have this lovely IP and someone's not. Um, I've seen instances where, unfortunately, um, like we, I was involved in a case where um, one of the SLPs had a child who, her own child, committed suicide. And they did not have enough staff with caseload constraints and other things for that SLP's caseload to be redistributed amongst the other. SLPs in the district. So then the district had the contract with where I was working at Easter Seals for us to come in and provide those services for them. Um, you know, so sometimes it's not an intentional type of a thing, 
but a lot of times the districts have trouble with complying with one or more aspects of the IEP, and a lot of times it's the allocation of resources that, um, that affects them. So thank you for sharing that. That's, that's a good um, example. Oh, I think it helps make it a little bit clearer. Um, so, that's the IEP process. We also have the 504 process. And remember, these are for kids or adults. It's not restricted to education. This can follow you in the workforce, um, in college. Um, these are folks that have other types of medical conditions and if they are involved with any kind of federal assistance, so that's why it goes beyond the schools. Most schools receive some federal, whether they're uh, elementary, middle school, junior high, high school, colleges, um, unless they're a completely private entity, most of them are going to receive some federal money. So they can't discriminate. But there are a lot of businesses and agencies. You know, if you are working for, say you're a, you have a hearing loss, and you're going to apply for a position, or you have a patient that is going to apply for a position at a new business that got a federal block grant, small business loan, to help them get started, they cannot not hire you or refuse to make accommodations for you just because you have some sort of a hearing loss or another type of disability. So 504 the qualification is not school, it's are you receiving federal assistance? Because if you're receiving any kind of federal monies, no matter how small, then Section 504 of the Rehab Act applies to you. Okay, so um, it's sort of a bridge between IDEA and the ADA because it goes beyond just the educational setting, it goes into the workforce as well, potentially, and into the above the age of 21, because remember IDEA only covers to the age of 21. Um, so it's nice because um, a lot of kids maybe don't meet the criteria, like how many kids with a processing disorder in those states isn't going to meet the criteria for IDEA for an IEP, but they still need help. They still need accommodations. And so, by the four, maybe they're court of refuge. The problem is that the school, in particular, is under no obligation, the family has to request it. Okay, so a big difference is that anybody can refer a kid for the IEP process, for that special ed process, but only the parents. So if you, you, know, you may be the speech pathologist and you're really concerned that the kid has some other has to come from the parents. Okay? And so as a result, in 504, there's usually no official written record. So let's look at it side by side. With IDEA, so the IEP process, a written plan is required, but there is no written plan required for 504. Under IDEA, the parents' rights are very specifically and very clearly spelled out. Under 504, it's very general and actually very few rights, other than the fact that they can say, I want this plan. Um, in the IEP process, under IDEA, parents are involved and provide input. Um, parents are notified that their request has been accepted or denied but they are not required to be involved to participate in the planning of any kind of interventions or accommodations. School can do that on their own, the employer can do that on their own, whoever it is. The 
parents do not have to be in. They're not required to be at their wedding party quite often. Um, under IDEA, there are very specific safeguards, very specific procedures that have to be followed to assure the, the rights and the safety of the, the individual. Under 504, there, the procedures are not clearly spelled out. Um, there's just some very general guidelines. So there is an increased risk for abuse or misuse of the system. Um, under IDEA, special ed services, <coughs> goals and objectives are clearly outlined. Um, but under 504, um, the procedures or accommodations can be very informal. Um, they're not necessarily you know, one of those objectives that has a specific start date, frequency, duration, and where it's going to be, can be much more generic. Um, idea of protection ends when they graduate from public school up to the age of 21. So a lot of times parents will defer their child's graduation until they are 21. Help with that transition, but um, with 504, the protection does extend beyond the high school graduation date. IDEA can be initiated by the parents, the schools, or some other professional, whereas 504 only by the parents. I can't, as a speech pathologist or audiologist who's seen the kid, say to them, No, you really should pursue a 504 plan for the child. I can tell them that, but <laughs> if they go to the school and say, oh, our audiologist said that we should do this, this, and this, the school can say, well, we're not saying that that's what we need to do. And so hopefully the parent that says, well, yes, now I am. Now that I know, I'm telling you this is what I want to happen. Then they would be obligated. But it doesn't automatically happen because someone suggested that's the point. The parents have to be aware and they have to request it. And those parents know. And I'll prove this to you with this scientific experiment. Randomly ask anybody that you know who's a parent. They know what their rights are for Section 504 or the Act of 1973. Yeah. There'll be one. Someone's got an attorney. So someone will know. But I bet you there won't be more than one. Parents just don't know. And the school's not obligated to tell them. Okay. Um, the final process that we may see some um, influence on is the ADA. Again, shocking. That may not be shocking to you. I mean, from when I was born, I was born up in 1990. But as someone who was fast approaching my 30th birthday at that point, um, it shocked me that it took us until 1990 to protect the rights of individuals with disabilities. But the ADA specifically addresses. Um, Pro, uh, prohibiting discrimination for in government services, which includes public schools, to promote access um, to uh, programs and services, um, and to um, meet the needs of students and others with um, special needs through accommodations and modifications. Those could be procedural. So any of those obstacles that were put in place to discourage parents from enrolling their kids had to come out. Um, they have to remove the architectural and communication barriers. <coughs> so um, that's one of the things Winston St. Public Schools undertook their massive rebuilding and renovation campaign that started about 10 years ago. Um, and that was one of the main problems. They had schools that were not able to efficiently or adequately accommodate the students. 
services or aids or assistive technology um, in order to assist with communication. Unfortunately, ADA did not provide a mechanism. So much that our student Congress does. Sometimes really brilliant ideas that So, it does specifically say that the school system has to administer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate. So, again, reiterates that whole part of idea about the least restrictive environment. So, ADA is really going to apply more for folks who have problems with hearing, communication, or with physical disabilities. And this, uh, this uh, section, the second section of Title II, uh, making accommodations and modifications, um, this particular part specifically addresses students, but there's another part that affects other things. So we have Braille on the drive up page again. Think about that. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the person in front of or behind the person who needs the braille at the drive of ATM. But we have to have it because of ADA. So. Okay. Do you kind of understand then how each of these has different implications and how the process is going to work through? For everyone? Yay, nay, maybe. Good, because we're stopping there today, and on Thursday, we're going to go over some cases and apply this and see how well we know and understand what we just went over. Uh, if you have not already emailed or turned this in, I'm taking um, the first year, and I have your exams over there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 